in dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Roy put on Christ. So in Christ, may Roy be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Roy Stone. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Let us pray together. O God, giver of life and conqueror of death, our help in every time of trouble, we trust that you do not willingly grieve or afflict us. Comfort us who mourn and give us grace in the presence of death to worship you, that we may have sure hope of eternal life and be enabled to put our whole trust in your goodness and mercy. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. You are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Grant us your blessing in this hour and enable us so to put our trust in you that our spirits may grow calm and our hearts be comforted. Lift our eyes beyond the shadows of earth and help us to see the light of eternity. So may we find grace and strength for this and every time of need through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I would invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together, Holy, 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 hymn number 64.
of God till I am holy thine till every earthly part of me glows with thy fire
be reading today from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord's work, righteousness, and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and graceful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always side, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for men, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they, they, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Good afternoon. Many of you know that a grandmother wrote poetry. Many of you may not know that grandfather memorized it. Um, I know for a fact that grandfather, even as recently as a year ago, could recite the entirety of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven from memory, something that he had memorized as a child to please one of his school teachers. You know, I tested him, I actually got it out and, and I read it with him and uh, he only needed two prompts, but he had the whole thing. Um, another of his favorites, was William Cullen Bryant uh, as Thanatopsis. And as I was thinking upon that poem, it, it just so struck me that he had really internalized it, you know, that it was there. And so I'll read to you a portion of that poem, uh, the very end. So live that when thy summons come to join the innumerable caravan which moves to that mysterious realm where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death, Thou go not like the quarry slave at night, scourged to his dungeon, but, sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust, approach thy grave like one who rapes, wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams. <laughs> now, doesn't that sound like what he just did? <laughs> um, and so I can't claim to have inherited 
all of his memory, nor can I claim to have inherited grandmother's gift for words, but I did want to try to write a poem for grandfather, and that's what this is. Words, words, grandfather of my words. You taught me all the ones I ever loved, and I loved the ones I heard, the way you wrinkled up your nose and smiled and said them grandly, lovingly, those special mountain words that run afire so swift and stout. On painter feet, they slide along in and out of the gullies and crevices of my mind and then leap out and cause other people to ask me where I'm from as I smile lovingly, realizing the unexpected word choice is one that you taught me. Stories, stories, grandfather of my stories, you taught me all the ones I ever loved, full of longing and full of glory. The way you paused just so and emphasized the part that made me laugh, those stories no one else can tell, of your father crossing the country in a wagon, of a wanting a nickel in the Great Depression, of the wonder of electricity, running water, and the first time you drove a car, a Model T, no less. I only wish that I knew more of them. It is your tales that let make me love all tales, tall tales, big and small tales. Soul, soul, grandfather of my soul, you are my grandfather whom I have loved and the patriarch of my soul. Elder chieftain of our tribe and gentle ruler of our clan, all the things I've learned of family, I've learned them at your hand. How in gentleness, humility, and love we tend the land. How to lead by kind example, not by fiat, not by command. You were the root of family that connected us all to the trunk of man. You have anchored us these many years, and it is by your strength that we stand. Dad was a very wise man, and through the course of my life with him, he shared many things with me. And of course, as all of you know, he loved to drive. So I'm going to share a few little driving wisdoms that I learned from my father that a friend of mine yesterday said, these are very well worth passing along. Number one, always know how to drive a stick shift. You never know when you'll be in an emergency situation and the only car to drive is a stick shift. So, yes, I have found myself in that situation when I had to drive a truck with a three-speed on the column. And it took me a bit, but I did manage to get that Christmas tree home. So, always know what's behind you. That goes without saying. Here's a good one. When it's been very dry, that first rain will make the road so slippery because of all the transmission fluids and the oil that has leaked. So that is the most dangerous the road is ever going to be because you'll be driving on slime. This is a good one too because we lived in Harrison Heights which was next to the hospital. Always be careful when you're driving around the hospital. People who are going to the hospital are going to see someone who is sick and they are not paying attention to what you're doing. So you better be. And I'm sure this came from his growing up on those mountain roads in Morgan County, those curvy, curvy roads. If you have to choose between a car and a squirrel, take the squirrel out. <laughs> now, my father said, and this was not something he told me when I was young, but later on in life, he said, you know, there are two kinds of people in the world the here I am people and the there you are people. The here I am person will not wave at you, will walk around the aisle in the store if they see you, will know that you have a need that they can fulfill and they will ignore you. But the there you are people will smile at you, pay you a compliment, go the extra mile for you, and if they have the means to help you, they will help you. Well, my dad was a there you are kind of a person. 
And I figured it out today. Dad lived 36,115 days. And I figure with the life that he led, he had a minimum of three times a day to be a there-you-are person. A hundred thousand times a there-you-are. What a great life. What a fabulous, fabulous life. And there's a country and western song out right now, and I'm not really fond of country and western music, but I love the lyrics. And I will just give you the refrain. At the end of each day, I hope and pray, Lord, I have done something good. He did. My very first memory in my entire life was in this church. My dad was carrying me down the stairs into uh, the old fellowship hall. I was two. And the day before, I had been a bit naughty. I had evidently wrestled the telephone away from my sister and had conked myself in the head and had to have stitches. Well, this particular memory, I'm embarrassed. And I know when we get to the bottom of the steps and turn the corner to the left, that there are gonna be a lot of people that are gonna wanna know what Carol and Jean had done. Well, luckily, I don't remember what happened when we got to the bottom of the steps. I just remember being in the arms of my daddy. Years later, I would be recounting this story in the presence of my parents and mother said, well, Carolyn Jean, you just had a little patch on the top of your head. And dad spoke up and he said, no, Joanne, the first 24 hours she had a big white bandage wrapped around her head. Dad always had a wonderful memory. And like Cosby said, he did know a lot of poetry, but Dad had a different kind of memory. He had the kind of memory that you could say, well, Dad, when did this happen? And he'd say, well, that was October of 57. And I'd say, well, how can you possibly remember that? And he said, well, I remember I was driving a 1957 green and white Buick <laughs> and the leaves were falling. I'm glad Cosby mentioned Thanatopsis because Along with Dad's memory, as Cosby mentioned, Dad recited poetry and he recited Thanatopsis to us all the time. I thought you might like to hear two reasons why I think Dad lived so long, and they're both biblical. Honor your father and your mother. Dad was a dutiful son. He took extraordinary care of his parents. When they were older, he brought them to Crossville, he built them a house, he built them a barn, and he went to see them just about every day. And the other one is, and it's all throughout the Bible, tell the truth. Dad believed in telling the truth. And I especially like the verse in Psalms that says, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep your lips from evil and your, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Basically, tell the truth. And the first most poignant story that I remember Dad telling me involved truth telling and school. When uh, he was a poor boy growing up in Appalachia and was blessed to get a scholarship uh, to go off to high school in East Tennessee. And he was so happy, but it was a working scholarship. And one of the things he did was he milked cows. And uh, those of you who know about milking cows, you know you don't milk cows Monday to Friday and then have the weekend off. You milk cows every day. But Dad loved being at school anyway. Well, one day, the president of the academy gave him a, an extra mission, and he wanted him to deliver a check to a supplier that was several miles away. So off Dad gets in the old jalopy truck that he's driving on the farm, 
and off he bounces to deliver the check. Well, the check he put in the front seat and he was enjoying driving so much he didn't notice that the check bounced off into the floor and through the floorboards. Back then, floorboards were real floorboards and this old jalopy truck was missing some of them. And when he realized that he, he got there and the check was gone, he knew that he was gonna have to go back to school and tell the president what had happened. And, but he knew he had to tell the truth and he just knew that he was gonna lose his scholarship, that they were gonna send him home. But the end of the story is good because the president had compassion on dad and he never forgot it. And I think you can see truth telling produced compassion and compassion produced fruit. And we see his fruit all over the county. So thank you all for coming. Your presence has comforted my heart. Thank you guys for coming. Um, our family's really grateful to see all you folks here. And it's just a day that you don't, well, well, I, I don't have words for it, but uh, you know, dad was a, without saying a compassionate and humble guy. And uh, when uh, our mother died, Connie and I would, uh, have him out for dinner on, on usually on Tuesday nights and we'd uh, cook something simple some baked chicken and vegetables pork tenderloin whatever and and we would tell stories and he would tell stories and uh, one night uh, Connie told a skunk story that was kind of funny and uh, I told a story about Dr. Reb and I hunting squirrels years and years ago and we were walking down a fence row and a uh, a skunk had climbed the fence and jumped behind us and we both turned around and I swear I thought that skunk was as big as a German Shepherd and we uh, we ran like children I mean but we had shotguns but we didn't uh, we were smarter than that I mean but uh, his uh, we were laughing and then his mood darkened and it darkened considerably and he just said kind of quietly uh, I don't like skunk stories. And, okay, you don't like skunk stories. And then he proceeded to tell us that in his teaching career, in his first assignment, I guess, it was here in Cumberland County, he was teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. And uh, it was during the heart of the winter, and uh, there was a family with two little children, a, a boy and a girl, and let's say they were seven and eight or eight or nine, and they hunted for their dinner in the evenings, and they'd gotten skunked. And uh, when the stove that heated the little one-room schoolhouse heated up, he'd had to send them home. And uh, he was 92 or three years old, and I expect that happened in his early 20s, and, and he'd carried that He'd carried that pain with him for 70 years. He didn't like skunk stories. <laughs> and that's who he was. But he was also a funny man, and he could be funny without trying. Um, in his late, mid to late 70s, he really took an interest in country music and line dancing. And prior to that, anyone that would be around him, he'd, he'd, he'd uh, tell them, you know, if I had it to do over again, I'd be an accomplished skier and an instrument rated pilot. And then as time went on, he would tell people, you know, well, um, I'd be a, 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 an instrument rated pilot, an accomplished skier, and a line dancer. <laughs> and so during this infatuation with line dancing, he would not only watch country music and, and the line dancing and um, 
but he'd also watch the shows, the gossip shows. And, the, and so we're at lunch one day, and it's my sister Carolyn and my mother and dad. And um, after we'd ordered lunch, he looked at Carolyn and I and asked us, well, let me ask you something. Uh, what do you think Alan Jackson's pant inseam is? And my, my, I'm not kidding. My, my sister and I rolled our eyes at each other and looked at our mother, and boy, she took him to task. And she said, what a ridiculous question. And, and he replied that, Joanne, some of us are out here trying to expand our horizons and learn some new things. <laughs> I wish I'd worn a blue shirt today. What do you think? Uh, I think that's all that's missing. If I take my glasses off, I'm honored to look like him a little bit. I never thought of it till the last couple of days, and people would be saying, "You know, you kind of look like your dad." Uh, that's an honor. Gosh, we could stand here for days and tell you Roy Stone stories. I was, uh, I told everybody one the other day they'd never heard, and I'd, I'd forgotten about this uh, until just recently, but Dad took me to Dallas once when I was just a kid. I remember going to Walker's. He bought me a pair of cowboy boots, my first pair. And I, I, I can remember thinking, I must be about seven feet tall. I could barely walk in those things, Reb. <laughs> you know. But uh, it was my first jet ride, and we left Nashville at night, and we took off, and uh, it had to have been a 707 or a 727. And when we got to altitude, you know, all the way up to out up, up to cruise, it was. <laughs> then suddenly it went. And I looked over at him and I said, Dad, I don't hear anything. And he looked at, back at me and he had this little look on his face. He said, we better pray. <laughs> I think maybe that was what we in our family called the Mammy Stone came out in him. Uh, <laughs> he got me good right there for a moment. So, a lot of you have heard this story before, but he had, um, for my 10th birthday, I got a half interest in a rototiller. <laughs> and uh, Dad, he knew I love machinery. I love, mach I love things that, engines and, I love anything that runs or tears up dirt or whatever. Uh, but I got him back. I, I, you, it, You've never seen anybody ride, ride a rototiller, I'll tell you how you do that. But <laughs> anyway, it didn't last long before it was junk. <laughs> on, on Wednesday last week when Daddy passed, I was, uh, I'd, I'd gotten, uh, Julia had called and was talking about, you know, Dad's not doing well. And so I ran out there and I spent some time with him. He knew me for a moment. Then he went back to sleep, and um, we had an appointment. Lisa and I had an appointment in um, Cookville, and we were down there at 4:30. And she was in the other room uh, doing some exercises, and I was standing there talking to our dear friend Petty Groth. And um, oh, it was just in the middle of the conversation, I had to stop and say, Petty. Do you feel that sweet spirit in the room? And it's, it was just a moment of just pure embrace. And then we, we continued on with our conversation. And so an hour and a half later, when we come out of the studio, uh, at 6 p.m., I looked at my uh, phone. It was in the car. 
And Mike had texted me and said, Dad died at exactly 4.30. And when the choir sang Sweet Spirit at the beginning of the service, it just reminded me that that was the Sweet Spirit. And uh, I think Dad was just taking one quick zoom around the planet before he went. So... <laughs> I'm the other Cosby, <laughs> and I don't do poetry. I just, I just mess up the choir, <laughs> as usual. But uh, a couple of stories, fun stories. Carolyn talked about how, how long uh, Dad had lived and some of the reasons why he lived so long. But uh, I was out at his house one day about four or five years ago, and he had 21, 22 pills lined up on the table. And it was Osei Berry, ginseng, St. John's wort, just everything he'd bought off television, you know. <laughs> and I mean, just all these different supplements and things. And, and, and I said, Dad, 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 you, this is not good. I mean, you, you, too much of this stuff is probably toxic. You don't know what's in all this stuff. I said, do, do you really have to take all these pills? And he got this funny look in his eyes. He says, he says, I've got to. One of these is keeping me alive. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe so. Uh, he, uh, he was a natural teacher, and as several have said, he, he, he told stories. And, uh, but but he, he, he had lots of teaching techniques. He, he was always playing around with us. And... Uh, when I was about to go off to college, he had kind of sized, we'd been sizing me up for 18 years, but he, he, he kind of knew me pretty well, and he, he, he looked at me and he said, uh, he said in olden days, when, uh, when monks would go off to their hermitage, you know, the little place of privacy up in the hills, a cave or whatever, uh, to, to meditate and pray and, and fast and be alone for a while, they would often be given a scripture or a, or a word or something to contemplate. And then when they came back from that uh, time of isolation, they would be asked to, to share what they had learned by contemplating on that word. And, and so as you go off to college, youngest son, uh, the word I want you to meditate on is organization. <laughs> and I kind of gulped and I knew why he gave me that word uh, but the years went by. I went through college. I finished graduate school. Um, I did think of it a few times over, over the years, I, 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 I admit. But he uh, approached me some years later, uh, just, just suddenly out of the blue. It's probably been 10 years had passed. And, and he, he said, uh, do you remember that word uh, that I asked you to meditate on when you when you went off to school? And I said, yes, I do. And uh, he said, what was the word? I said, organization. And I said, and Dad, I know what you were trying to do, but I, it really didn't work because I'm really not any more organized than I was before. And he said, of course it worked. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you married the most organized person I know. <laughs> And, and uh, it's true, and he was right. And uh, anyway, I, I think about Dad now, and I, and I think about all the time he has to contemplate. Uh, and I have a word for you, Dad. And the word is glory. Amen. Today, he loved the fact that I was up bright and early with the sun like my father and we enjoyed so many sunrises together. Um, something else was, um, Margaret kind of stole my thunder a little bit about the cars, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, rules of driving. 
There are no rules in a parking lot. Always drive defensively in a parking lot. Always drive defensively at the hospital because someone has gotten bad news, may have lost a loved one, and always yield to the doctors because they get no sleep at all. <laughs> when I was 16 years old, because at 14 I had decided that I was breaking away from, I was breaking the mold. I had older brothers and sisters and I wanted to be just like them right then. I was going to private school. So I went to the same school my father went to. And he was so pleased. And I was horrified to find out the rules hadn't changed since he'd been there. <laughs> Most of the kids there had been there because they were sent there. I went there because I chose to go there. It was school for the arts, and I did win some awards. And back then it was not cool to win awards, so I would not let him announce them. But one of them was speech. So uh, it was the delivery, he said, that I needed to work on. And um, one day he announced to me, after he found out at age 16, that I was going to graduate early because at Washington College Academy, punishment was going to school on Saturday. So as a junior, I graduated with more credits than any senior in the school. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I can't believe I got through that year. Actually, I got hepatitis and had to come home. Um, so he decided I needed a car. And I remember we were in North Knoxville. I could not tell you the name of the dealership or where. I could now if it happened now, but not then. And um, he had his eye on this little red kind of sports car. And I said, but Daddy, it's what my father said. Julia, it's not a four in the floor, it's a five in the floor. But Dad, I can't drive a stick shift. Well, I'm going to go in and make this deal with this gentleman. And they proceeded to write down a number and pass it back and forth to each other. And my father had this chest fire cat grin on his face, just back and forth they went. And after, I was just like, <sighs> and he said, go out there and learn how to get first gear down so we can leave. I don't want the car, Dad. It's too little. The key's on the left side, and it's a five in the floor, and there's no motor in it. I didn't know anything about mid-engine cars, and I didn't know anything about German cars. But my father and I love the sound of a fine motor. And since then, um, I've had a few of those fine motor cars. And when I would uh, purchase one, unbeknownst to me and my mother, my father would announce, I'm riding home with Julia. Okay. And then I would, we would get in the car and he would say, how fast can she go? <laughs> how fast have you had her up to? Take the interstate. Let's hear her scream. Oh, listen to her purr. He just loved the sound of a fine motor. And I am my father's daughter. Sunsets. When we moved out of Harrison Heights and moved um, uh, on Beehive Lane, we no longer had the beautiful sunrises, but we had the most beautiful sunsets. For years, I had the honor of being with my parents and watching the sunset. And they dreamed. It was an unobstructed view. He had property all the way to Genesis Road. But their dream was a school, and there is still a beautiful view there. And it is a dream that has come true for my parents. And now, Dad, the sun has risen, and it shall never set again. I thought when the sisters got to the top of the steps, I thought, there you are. <laughs> and someone saw and helped you down. 
I'm going to read the poem that Joanne wrote to Roy in, uh, on Father's Day 2001. It's on the back of your bulletin. To Father Roy, 54 years ago today, your fatherhood was on its way. So the nightstand beside your bed was used for Margaret's needs instead. Seventeen months later, last day one, Carolyn Jean's life is begun. Moved from upstairs to the ground floor, a neat little home with a red door. You bought a bulldozer, built a road in Harrison Heights. A field was sold. A built, you built a new house done Christmas Day. Your first baby boy was on the way. Mike born in March the very next year. On June 22nd, son Steve was here. Jeff born two years later on August 1. May of 57, Bert Cosby, fourth son. The house was full, one room held four, pregnant again, no more room for more. Father decides to extend his home. Julia arrives with a room of her own. He worked so hard from morn till night. <clears throat> A man will do it right. A man with will to do it right. With mercy, integrity is your name. A man of character is your fame. Thank you for making me your wife. I share your tough, successful life. I thank the Lord. Now I can see you were the man he chose for me. Your kids are beautiful and strong like you. They try to do no wrong. Observe the fruits of doing good. They honor you and your fatherhood. Hugs and kisses, love forever, Joanne. Our Heavenly Father has acted with uh, hugs and kisses for all of us when he sent the best that he had. We call his name Jesus. And with all the hugs and kisses of our Heavenly Father, Jesus prepared himself to bear his cross to show God's good love for all God's children. And in preparation for that, he gathered his disciples around him and prepared them for the most painful hug and kiss they would ever see but that would hold them in hope for all eternity. I want you to stand and hear the words of the one we call Jesus to his disciples, inclusive of you and me, present day disciples of Jesus. So would you stand? to receive these from the Gospel of John. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again 
and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Cosby gave me a story of... Um, that his father told about his uh, early years. Dad was a great storyteller, Cosby wrote. He loved an audience and he could very often summon a compelling story to complement some recent news or a significant occasion. One of the amazing things about dad's stories is that there, was all, there always seemed to be a lesson, a moral. He was a born teacher. And yet he wasn't uh, always overt or preachy when sharing a story. He could be very subtle. In August of 1929, having just turned 14, dad waved a tearful goodbye to his parents at the Rockwood bus station. In the spring, he had finished eighth grade and the only way for him to continue his education was to go away to high school. There was no high school that he could attend from his home in a remote area of Southern Morgan County. His grammar school teacher had recognized him as an exceptional student and with his teacher's help, Dad was accepted to Washington College Academy in Johnson City. Originally both a high school and a college, this was an old Presbyterian school, said to be the first and oldest high school west of the Alleghenies. The headmaster and many of the teachers were graduates of Princeton University, and so this school represented an enormous opportunity for a young boy who had grown up in the backwoods of Pine Orchard on the Rockwood Mountain. Dad changed buses in Knoxville and began a long and tedious ride to Johnson City. Johnson City might as well have been Timbuktu because he'd never traveled so far from home before and certainly not by himself. As the bus made stops in town after town, winding its way eastward, Dad became good friends with the bus driver. The further the bus traveled eastward, <clears throat> the closer to the driver he felt. He didn't want the bus ride to end, and so after a long day, he felt a pang of fear and remorse when the driver pulled up to an imposing gate and said, this is it. They unloaded Dad's heavy trunk beside the road, said farewell, and the bus drove away in the fading light. 
He looked through the gateposts of a long driveway at a large and dark building about 150 yards up a steep hill. His trunk was too heavy to carry up the hill alone. He was hungry and the dark of night was descending. A great wave of loneliness, homesickness, and despair overcame him. What if no one is here? What if they aren't expecting me? Do I really belong in a place like this? How will I ever get up this hill? Suddenly a light burst forth from the gray building above. A door had opened. He saw three figures piling out the door. As they ran down the hill, he realized that they were boys about his age, laughing and jostling one another cheerfully. As they drew near, they were also doing something that he'd never forget. They were waving and smiling at him. Don't worry, they joked. We've saved you some dinner. The boys reached Dad all out of breath, shook his hand vigorously, and introduced themselves. They grabbed up his heavy trunk, and the four of them together carried it up the dark hill and into the bright light. of the open door. I'm going to quit there with those words rather than continuing with uh, Cosby's words. Bus rides over here. An arrival has taken place and that dark door that seems closed that we call death has been thrown open a bright light has come from that door and three figures Father Son Holy Spirit have run down the hill into his life and said there's something for you to eat now prepare us the table as well as anointing my head and the father on earth who made a room for each child of his a place for them while they were getting ready to be born is met by a father's love who prepared a place for him through the life and mercy of Jesus and the welcoming power of the Holy Spirit a room of his own Today, that's your hope and mine. That if we ride the bus through this world and come to the gates, a door will throw open and light will emerge into our darkness. And the three will welcome us. Claim that hope let Jesus introduce you to the Father Amen we're going to sing a song see 
now, I took this off your preacher's wall. And he'd been making some smart statements to his uh, wife's aunt. And I told him, I said, Drew, it is not well with your soul. <laughs> but whatever be tied, however great the storm, however hurtful the pain, it is well with our soul as it is with his. So let's stand and sing that. And then we'll have some prayers. May be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, 
Receive Roy Stone into the arms of your mercy. Raise Roy up with all your people. Receive us also and raise us into a new life. Help us so to love and serve you in this world that we may enter into your joy in the world to come. God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even unto this day. For the gift of joy in days of healing and strength. And for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in the days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends and for our baptism and place in your church with all who have faithfully lived and died. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for us. And as he taught us, so now we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.